All right, we're going to get started here. Uh, how does everybody hear me? Good? All right. Um, my name is Robert Miranda. I'm here, uh, here to welcome you. Welcome to a debate that uh, we should have had and we should have in our community. Uh, but we are lucky to have some candidates that see the value in debating because it's important for citizens of this community who vote to really understand and know what these candidates present, what they represent, and what they want to do in this very glorious city, the city of Milwaukee. Uh, I represent the Freshwater for Life Action Coalition. I'm also a member of the Get the Lead Out Coalition Steering Committee. On behalf of those two coalitions and the Black Health Coalition, who is also a sponsor of this event, and Kingfish.com, who is also a sponsor of this event, I'd like to welcome all of you to this very important debate. Uh, as you see, we have two of the four candidates here today. Uh, they're here because they are committed to presenting their views, their opinions, and their ideas to the people of this city. And it's important for us to get every word they have to say so we make the right choices that are coming up here very soon. Um, Mayor Barrett was invited. He sent the message saying that because of a scheduling conflict, he wasn't able to make it, uh, but that if time allows, he might show his face. Don't hold your breath. Uh, Alderman Tony Zielinski initially confirmed and said he would be here, uh, but then uh, rescinded, said he would not be here after he found out Mayor Barrett wasn't coming. He said he's running against the mayor and he wants to debate the mayor. Take that as you may. But we do have some candidates here. And it's good that we have a lot of cameras here <laughs> because it's going to be out there on social media and those guys are going to regret they weren't here. Um, tonight is going to be a debate on this very important issue of lead and water. Now, being an organization that started this movement almost five years ago, I would be remiss if I would not mention one important name of an individual who really got me to understand some of these issues and got me to organize around this issue. And that was five years ago when he ran for mayor and that's Alderman Joe Davis. <coughs> Alderman Joe Davis, when he ran for mayor, sounded that alarm. He said, we got issues here. We got issues going on with our water. We got issues going on with these lead pipes. And as I started organizing around this issue, we realized that we as a city were way behind on informing our community how hazardous these lead pipes are to the lives of our children, of our families, and to this city. 70,000 lead pipes is nothing to sneeze at, folks. 70,000 hazardous pipes that pose a risk to your health and to the health of your children is an issue that we all should be sounding a five-alarm fire on. It's no reason why we're three times the national level on lead poisoning in this city. And lead and water is a big contributing factor based on the research that our researchers have done and presented to the steering and rules committee meetings of the city of Milwaukee and to the public health committees of the city of Milwaukee. Data compiled by one of our researchers, and I want to recognize him, Thomas Walzenbach. Stand, please, and get a clap for the data and for the research he's done, GIS mapping, and presented that to the city. To Robert Penner, wherever, where are you? Yeah, right here. Yeah, stand up, you gotta be recognized for the research he's done 
and showing how these lead laterals were basically mandated by the city of Milwaukee in 1872. And in 1921, the city common council mandated the use of lead laterals again, telling the city they need to use extra strong lead. That's a quote from the resolution. And not only that, the legacy of slavery still lives in these lead pipes because the slaves were brought up from Kentucky to mine the lead that we're using today. And not only that, corruption around these lead is also a legacy. The research that Robert put out there in regards to former Mayor Harrison Ludington, who had a vested interest in the lead mines back in the 1870s and bought up property in Walker's Point and other districts in this city. And then became mayor and helped mandate that lead laterals be connected to the water mains of this city. And the fact that a lot of these lead pipes have been underground, not only since the 1870s, but in the 1840s they started laying these lead pipes on the ground. We have pipes that are poisoning our community, have been poisoning our community for over 120 years. Now, the city will say corrosion control through the use of orthophosphate is helping to keep us safe. But that argument is being challenged by new studies and new research. Corrosion control, orthophosphate is just that. It's about corrosion control. It's not about stopping the lead leaching into the water. And lead leaches into the water. Be it soluble lead or particulate matter, it leaches into the water. Now until we started organizing prior to five years ago, how many of you have been notified by the waterworks people when you got your bills to be careful with the lead pipes? Before 2019, before 2018, before 2017. Now all of a sudden you're getting letters and you're getting information. That's because community grassroots organizing forced the city to do right, to inform our community about this hazard and this risk to their lives. The next step is to demand that they remove these things. And that's why we're holding this debate today. Because it's not about just coming up with half measures. It's about going the full boat, passing the envelope and saying, get the money we need. Instead of building another castle in Camelot, go ahead and remove these lead laterals. It's time that that happens. So I'll get off my soapbox right now and give the mic to Mr. Earl Ingram. Mr. Earl Ingram, as you all know, is the host of the Earl Ingram Show on WRRD 1510 AM, and they've also gone FM now, too. 101.7. 101.7, statewide radio. He's a great man, great moderator, and a good friend of mine, Mr. Earl Ingram. All right. Um, thank you very much, Robert. And it is critically important when you look at our young people in the schools and you see the condition that many of them are in and you constantly hear people talking about why can't Milwaukee Public Schools educate those children? Milwaukee Public Schools is a failure because they can't educate these children. But when you're in the schools and you take a look at some of our babies, you understand that there's something else going on. This is as critical a subject matter as there could ever be. And so I'm honored, Robert, that you guys give me an opportunity to be a part of it. Let's get busy. Let's introduce our guests first, the candidates. 
And we'll start with Senator Lena Taylor. You just want me to introduce myself. I'm State Senator Lena Taylor. I represent the 4th Senate District. I'm a candidate for mayor. I'm born and raised in Milwaukee. I live on 15th and Capitol, and I'm running for mayor because I believe that the leadership is stagnant. I believe that the corruption and, very candidly, the cronyism, that enough is enough. And in the words of Fannie Lou Hamer, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I believe that what the mayor has done in the last 16 years, the question is, what can he do in the next four that he didn't do in the last 16? And so as a result of that, I'm saying, give me an opportunity to lead. I'm Paul Rasky. I'm also, too, you know, from Milwaukee. Um, pretty much lived here most of my life, um, you know, except for going away for school, a few, you know, travels internationally for business and pleasure and things like that. Um, and I start. Oh, you can't hear me again. I tend to. <laughs> yeah, I'm used to being behind the scenes, you know, not so much in front of it. But um, it is a great opportunity to really take on problems that nobody else you know, has done before. And that's really how I got into the race. Um, you know, I was back in 2016 watching everything like everybody else, um, and I found myself defending people with billions of dollars, and then the other side was just, it was, it was crazy. Uh, and I also realized, too, that I had a lot of what I, you know, what I saw as solutions to these problems. And pretty much, if you sum it up all in just a, really a, a bullet point, is that I really want the problems that nobody else wants, uh, you know, things like this. You know, I, I don't, I'm not happy that the problem is here, the lead pipe, but now that it is, uh, people like me, like Lena, are, are really ideally suited, you know, to take this problem on. Um, and I think we both have excellent ideas, you know, to take it on. I have a, a, a solid background in science technology, but I've also done enough reading and law and study to know that it's a very, very complicated problem. And this issue of lead in the water goes back to maybe 800 BC. I mean, we knew that lead was a problem in the late 19th century. So, so sir, with all yeah, due okay. respect, let's, let's get into the debate. Okay, great. All right, so uh, let's begin. Uh, do you feel that Milwaukee's elected leaders have done a good job addressing the toxic lead crisis we are facing now. And just for you and the listening audience, we are going to take questions from you two as we move on. Uh, but Senator Taylor, you are an elected official. Uh, do you think that the leadership of the elected has done a decent job in bringing this, this situation to the forefront? Um, do we mean elected across all levels uh, across of government? All, yes. All right, so the answer is no, I do not. Uh, believe that uh, the electeds have done the most effective job. Let me start by saying um, before I was elected, we had cryptosporidium. And clearly after the, cri after the crypto um, incident, Madison in particular had to be informed that they had some type of lead in the water issue. Why do I say that? Because they proceeded to do a plan to address lead laterals. They fixed their lead laterals. They even, I want to say it was 20, I don't, I don't remember the number, but 2012 at the very latest, um, 2016, something like that, they finished fixing the lead laterals in their area. Unlike them, Milwaukee instead, and they had to fight in order to be able to do that because they were asked to do the same thing that Milwaukee did, which was to use the phosphorus to line um, the laterals. Uh, short version to that, that means that we knew. Now, the lack of transparency and inclusion is one of the problems that I feel that exists in this administration. Uh, I was not elected. At that time, uh, the now mayor would have been either in the assembly or the Senate or in the Congress, but the point is, is he's been elected for all of the time until now. And nothing was done outside of doing the lining. So for me, at the federal level, um, there were some EPA rules and guidelines that I think um, were not in line with what the best practices were telling us about lead. And so I think that the EPA standards could have changed since then. And since a lot of work on the ground, whether it's Flint, whether it's um, Milwaukee or whatever, 
there have been movements to say like, don't flush before you test. Wait, 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 but it, it said we could have take all the time we needed for an answer, since uh, that's what the new rules says. So I want to finish my answer if I could, please. Well, we got Thank a lot of questions, I, go I, res ahead. I respect that, but all it right. did say we could have time. That was the new modified rules. And so I just want to make sure that I'm saying that at the federal level, I think that federally the EPA could have moved more quickly, right? to require that any amount of lead was a problem, that you shouldn't flush, you shouldn't whatever. At the city level, clearly, we were in denial. I remember when I did the letter in January, um, uh, when I said something in January of 2016, the mayor was denied. They denied that there was a problem, that they were, um, that their uh, request, that, that their uh, their recommendation to flush was not okay so, so so i have to stop you because there's other parts of it too so is it solely that the mayor himself no other elected officials this is an issue that has been promulgated by the mayor himself one person not the common council no, not the state no one else is responsible no that that's not what i was saying when it, when you said that every level of government i started at the federal i was going to go to the state i was going to also mention the county and i also was going to mention locally but because of the time constraints that i was feeling i went from the federal and i skipped to the local to tell you what it was but i would argue that the state had a role also and the state had a role because the city had an ordinance but the state had a mandate and the state's mandate did not um, did not lift until later, and so originally you had to use lead. Then it was you didn't you you weren't mandated to use it, but then it came a time that it was prohibited, which is another reason why the seventy thousand homes is actually probably not accurate. Okay, so so I have to stop you because we got many other questions that you're going to get a chance to answer. Okay, well, so Earl, we have to go. Earl, Earl, may I say one thing? What's two that? things. The rules that I received said one thing, and and two other people refused to even come. So oh, so let me say this to you, Senator Taylor. I don't it's want to be disrespectful, it, it, but I don't want to be disrespectful. Well, this is not about one person. This is about trying to get the information. We've got 25 to 30 questions, and if we're going to allow one person to spend 20 minutes on one question, we never move forward. So, yes, sir, you, you are next. What do you say? Well, it's okay if we stay longer. That's fine with me. Um, but what I think is a complex answer, uh, initially right now or more recently, you know, there's been progress, so there's been yes and no more recently. Uh, but again, you know, more recently, yes and no. Um, there's some things the Common Council has done, you know, very well. You know, I saw that just kind of reviewing for tonight. There's a lot of things that Lena has done. So let me congratulate you because, you know, she was in the trenches fighting that and her name came up over and over again when I was doing searches. So, you know, that has to be said too. So I think she's done an excellent job with it. I think if you want to solve the problem, you're looking at the two people that'll probably solve it for you. Um, so recently they've done, you know, they're, you know, they're monitoring, they're suggesting things like testing, I agree with that. Um, but the fact that it hasn't been resolved and we've known about it for a long time, you know, you don't want to throw stones at anybody or say that somebody's done a horrible job because most of these people are my friends or I know them or I've known them, you know, a very long time. So there are budgetary issues, there are balancing of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of different problems, all of which can cause us harm. But yes, I mean, in the minimum aligning solution, and if you're, it, it, when Lena mentioned lining, uh, I think what she's referring to is like when you drive through the city and you see visit sewer, you know, kind of doing inspections of sewers and re they're, putting in liners to, you know, short of digging up the sewer system. You can do that on smaller diameter pipes as well. Um, you know, so I think yes and no. I think our city in some ways has been a leader, but it's just not enough. You have to find the money to do it. And in a budget with more than a billion dollars in it, it, you know, that's what you do. You find the money for it one way or the other. At first, the mayor couldn't find anything, and now all of a sudden, just before the election, he's found, what, 2.2 million before there was nothing available. And at the state level, I did not get a chance to speak to that. I am the one who pressed for the Department of Neighborhood, I mean, not Neighborhood, sorry, Department of Natural Resources, Secretary um, Kathy uh, Stepp, to be able to provide so, dollars. So, Senator Taylor, we were going to get to came. that question down the road. We've got that question that you just are addressing. That's why we're trying to have 
go down the list of questions that are here and you would have had an opportunity to do that. So let's, let's address this issue. Uh, what do you think of Milwaukee's current lead paint abatement program? Either of you. If it's still a problem, which it is, um, you know, there's always more, you know, that you can do. Um, I didn't review an awful lot about that except to know that, you know, it is actually in some ways a worse problem than the lead pipe problem because children can ingest it, they can breathe the dust. Uh, I mean, it's a problem for us too. And, you know, as I was looking, you know, even, uh, you know, getting ready, uh, one of the things I did is I looked up my address. And I don't know about yours, Lena, but. I was shocked to see that we do have a lead pipe and you can actually trace that back into time into my own family and see things that, gee, I wonder if that's why that happened and I wonder if that's why it took a little longer for me, you know, to do this. Um, you know, and I know somebody else who has a, a kidney, it, you know, is waiting for a kidney and I'm wondering if I check their address would they have a lead pipe in it because that's one of the things I believe that it can cause. So. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's something that we need to say on top of all of those types of things. Uh, and if, I think if there's a kid in a house and you have paint, you have to know what it is. So that's where it's testing, 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 and staying on top of it. Um, it's hard to watch a kid. I played with my niece, and she can put, or my grandniece actually, um, and I was there every second, and she still got into something. So I, I think everybody needs to know the environment. Uh, one of the things that I would do as mayor is find out where all the kids are, all the families are, and make sure that they were aware you know, of some of these basic things. Same question, Senator Taylor. Would Any? you like to repeat it? What do you think of Milwaukee's current lead paint abatement program? When you say lead paint, I think that's the problem. It's only lead paint, and it's not lead in the entire environment. There are contaminations in the soil, as well as the water, as well as lead paint. Um, presently, the program has been going on for a significant period of time, and we've done a number of houses, um, but I personally believe that the program has not looked at the entire environment when, it's, when they've done the work that they've done. And as mayor, one of the things that I would want to make sure that we do is look at the entire environment. I think that it is um, shameful that we have individuals, lead stays in you. And so if you are not addressing the issue in a home and someone is pregnant, it still has a direct effect. So, you know, do I think that we've done some things good? Of course we have. But do I believe that we've addressed the issue? Of course we haven't. And Children's Hospital saying that now our children are testing when they come, even though we may have less number of kids that have tested positive for lead, the concentration levels are much higher. All right, next question. In developing a comprehensive plan for lead removal, Will you prioritize communities of color who have been most immediately and chronically impacted by toxic lead? That's an easy answer. Absolutely. You go where the, pro you go where the problems are the worst. Uh, you make sure you're not missing anything. But it's just basic triage and stay on top of it. Absolutely. Not even a question. I agree. However, the largest concentration of lead laterals in particular is on the south side of Milwaukee and so that's very important that we do wherever we need to triage and um, I think we have to do a better job of as I said earlier testing the entire environment because we cannot just assume that it is lead paint we, we can't do that and testing water is a very difficult process quote unquote to be able to do and so either way it goes yes we need to know where the issues are based on where children are um, uh, testing uh, high with lead, but we also need to then do it in the buildings that the city owns, which are the schools. And we can't say, well, we own the schools, but MPS uses the schools, so it's MPS's problem. If I'm the owner of a home, it's my, it's my responsibility to deal with the lead paint or lead laterals and so as a result of that I think as a city we need to make sure that we're looking at our schools and making sure that we're addressing the issues that exist there. Would you consider that the most impacted of Milwaukee communities use precipitatory budgeting 
and other forms of community-based democratic solutions like forums, neighborhood assemblies, etc., as a means of addressing our lead crisis. I, if I understand the question correctly, um, it, it really comes Let me do down. It again. Yeah. Would you consider that the most impacted of Milwaukee communities use participatory budgeting and other forms of community based democratic solutions like forums, neighborhood assemblies, etc., as a means of addressing our lead? crisis sure uh, the more two-way communication there is in setting a budget and setting priorities um, and the more professionals uh, you know a lot of times when I call in problems you know to people there's not an awful lot they can do and they're elected officials or they're in public office um, and, and that and you never get an answer you know back uh, so part of it is yes you have to know you know what the big picture is that's kind of you know would be our jobs right you know the big picture setting priorities uh, and then looking for the worst problems then there are a lot of experts that one can turn to you know doctors scientists engineers you know how to approach the problem um, and you know historically she's absolutely right there are lead is pretty much everywhere I mean there are fixtures that I saw and looking for this that are made out of lead and they can be almost anywhere and it's just not even completely known where all the pipes are these are estimates that in the Midwest alone it's oh, maybe three and a half million of these laterals or pipes you know that are buried and nobody quite knows and to find all that data uh, you might actually have to go back to the plumbers they might be the only people that have the records of where those are or was something used that's a tremendous amount of work um, so there are some solutions where uh, just dealing with budgeting yes you have to look at where the problems are focus the money there um, you know and part of it is being smart of how you approach these problems uh, measuring inspection there's a lot of new technologies that are being used um, again I mentioned busy sewer in part uh, a resident sewer in part uh, that type of thing might help but again anything that you do anytime you try to measure something you can actually create more problems so it is a very delicate balancing act but yeah I want to see resources allocated and spent where we think we have the most problems and this is uh, a huge problem there's no question about it you know transparency and inclusion I said earlier is an issue uh, that I don't believe that this administration respects I don't think they respect the people ie they're not even here today but his staff is here to take notes so for me um, participatory budgeting is no different it's including the people in the process and so I do believe that that's that that is um, something that should happen but I also believe that it should happen in the way of um, trying to be creative with funding mechanisms you know um, whether or not we could use tips or whether or not we could um, use things like that you know being innovative is my point so we've got a, a, uh, a governor who has decided he wants to uh, add $40 million in the budget to address lead issues in Milwaukee and across the state. And we have Robin Voss and Scott Fitzgerald who have turned that down because they say that the city of Milwaukee would benefit more so than others. What, what would either of you do to address the fact that we have a state government that doesn't seem to appear to be interested in addressing those issues so the first thing I'll say as someone who's at the state level um, it's difficult when you have a leader of a city and the individuals there do not believe that that person has been a good steward of the taxpayers dollars when they believe that they um, have um, been wasteful with the taxpayers' dollars. When the city departments have not been audited for 10 years, I can't argue that that's not true. And so one of the things that I will do is audit all city departments in order to be able to show at the state level that there is a different mindset in regards to how we proceed. The other piece is you have to use what you have effectively. I'll give an example. When we fought during the Sherman Park uprising 
in order to be able to get money to be able to deal with the city of Milwaukee, we got Scott Walker to give 4.5 million to the city of Milwaukee. Two million, the mayor wanted to use just to do demolition, demolition of houses. That's make more vacant lots. I went into the meeting. I was the only legislator in the meeting that pushed back on the mayor and said, that is not what should happen. We should not just do demolition. We should do rehab of houses and we should do deconstruction of houses and we should do a worker training program and we should do something to be able to build capacity for businesses. Long story short, I wasn't invited to any more of the meetings and after not being invited to any more of the meetings, um, I then went to the Walker administration and said, last time you gave $2 million on houses, you gave it and it was a blank check. The mayor could use it however he wanted. I said, you cannot give the mayor a blank check. So I asked at the state level that requirements be put on that they have to hire someone from the zip from the area that the house is in in addition to that that they would have to do both I mean all three reconst uh, rehabilitation um, and I'm sorry the two things rehabilitation and deconstruction but they said they're gonna let him do demolition so I said well so be it so I say that to say a Robin Voss a Scott Fitzgerald, or for that matter, anybody else that's in this audience should care whether or not our dollars are used effectively. You cannot continue to ask the state, and don't get me wrong, we do not get our fair share. The state takes too much, whether it's at the county or whether it's at the city level. But you cannot expect someone to respect you. If, you know, I'll give an example. If you have, a, um, a, you know, a home uh, and you, uh, have a leaky roof and you know you decide not to address that roof at some point it's gonna be a real problem inside your home but if you choose to go on a vacation to Jamaica or you choose to go and buy a car some, somebody your wife somebody should be looking at you sideways okay that is how they feel if we did the um is it called the streetcar or is it called the, I, I don't remember which one it's called the trolley the, whatever the, the what is it called the, the name of okay, the hop so the hop so so people are like furious in Madison about the hop even though that money could only be spent in a certain way they don't believe that the mayor has been a good steward of our dollars so okay. I believe that I would be able to create a different perspective so so hold on senator so as a taxpayer and a property owner and uh, in this city and in this state I don't want decisions based on politics when it comes to whether or not our children should be drinking clean water. I don't and, disagree. And, and, and I think that if that is what we are talking about, all of that's got to be fixed. Well, if somebody is saying we are not going to do what is right because somebody is spending money in the wrong manner, on the city level, mm -hmm. I can't go along with that because the children are being endangered. Yeah, Earl, I, I would agree with you that it that you know in this perfect world that it would be great if we could say, well, you know, this is what we should do for education, or this is what we should do for that, and that everybody's going to do what is right. Earl, the reality is is that we're all human, and the reality is is that in Madison, I'm in the minority. And the reality is, is that Robin Voss and Scott Fitzgerald get to call the shots. And the reality is, whether, they, whether we like it or not, the reason that they make decisions and choices, they articulate that. And so, it does matter. It does matter. And, and guess what? If, if you disagree, then you as w could, should come with me and other people that go to Robin Voss's district and Fitzgerald district and other districts and help to unelect those people that you don't believe are doing a good job. But you asked if this issue exists with Robin Voss and Fitzgerald, how would I handle it? And I'm saying I would address by audit auditing the departments. I would address it by showing a better uh, fiscal responsibility 
with our budgeting process because I don't believe not auditing the department for 10 years is letting you know what situation you're in. And right. I gave you the example of one of the things that irritates them to the fullest extent. All right, yes sir. Now, uh, were you asking would, we, would I take the $40 million as mayor? No, so what I was asking is based on, again, the fact that $40 million was put on the table okay. by Governor Evers mm -hmm. to address and assist this city in addressing those lead issues, yet it was turned down by, by Robin Voss and Scott Fitzgerald because of many different reasons, mm -hmm. supposedly, one of them, the streetcar and how that money is being spent. Right. You say what to that? Well, it should have come here. I mean, that, again, one of the things that I would do is act as a trustee, and that's different than being a politician. It's you know trying to do the right thing in all the instances, and sometimes the right thing is, you know, yes, you want to know where the money's going and try and solve those problems, but if people in the departments are running in fear, and it's not a dig or anything, uh, you know, no, 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 it's, it's cool because we're, we're good friends, you know, and I think part of the problem is, uh, you know, I want to see the solutions come together collaboratively. Uh, and that's really, in, you know, really, really important is that I'd rather cede power and, you know, work with the Common Council, work with Lena. Uh, one of the things that I would try to do if I was mayor, and she knows this because I'm, I'm a fan too, of course, um, is I would try to make some, you know, work together with her regardless of where she is, if I could bring her into the administration. Uh, you know, it, it's not so much about having power as it is finding the right solutions, and that's working, you know, really, you know, with everybody. So, you know, and the same thing holds for Tom, too. You know, he's a friend. I like him. He's a great guy. Everybody has a Tom Barrett story. I have bunches of them that go back, you know, to I think when he was even in Congress, you know, uh, you know and at state conventions, you know, for the Democratic Party. So, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that I function really amazingly well at is as a gatekeeper. Uh, you know, and if we've got a set of problems, that's the pro set of problems that I'm going to work on. Um, you know, I really wanted the job for maybe a term and then move on, you know, to another elected, you know, position, you know, after that. Um, so I think it's really, really important given that we have so many problems and we have so many issues. Um, it, it's, you know, uh, not to play politics with it. These are people's lives. This is drinking water. This is a public safety issue. And, you know, I'm not, I'm going to do it with the least disruptive uh, amount of, you know, work possible because that's not going to create anything, uh, anything good out of it. So uh, I'm going to, you know, uh, you know, if I became mayor tomorrow, the same staff would be there and it probably would be there four years from now. Um, I believe you can always work with people. You can always find, you know, a solution, you know, in the vast majority of, you know, of cases. You know, and same thing here is, you know, trying to spend money. We've got a lead pipe problem. We've got a public health problem. Part of it relates to education. I would find very smart ways, you know, to make sure that people who are affected or potentially affected would know, you know, and I'm trying to do so in a way that wouldn't frighten them. Another part, you know, is, as Lena mentioned about financial innovation, um, you know, that's one of the things that I have a, a big expertise in is designing financial markets, financial products, and it's not even difficult, you know, to do that. So we could probably just in five minutes come up with five products that would allow us to deal with any financial issues um, that are dealing, you know, with this problem. Uh, obviously, the quicker it can be resolved, the better. Uh, staying on top of it, knowing where, you know, to put the resources, you know, how to, you know, where really where to put the focus. I'm sorry. So, no. So do you Could feel I correct one thing? I just want to make sure that I'm really clear that it was in the governor's budget. It got voted against by 12 individuals actually on the Joint Committee on Finance and, um, and four members from the Democratic Caucus that are on the Finance Committee voted for it. So although I respect that you probably mean that uh, Robin Voss and Scott Fitzgerald are the leaders and you feel as if they did it, it really got taken out of the budget by the Joint Committee on Finance. So you know, clearly that I would stand corrected, but clearly what I will say is that we continue to talk about the fact that the city does not get its due 
for what happens on the state level. It didn't just start, it's been happening. And one of the reasons that the city is in the condition it's in is because it doesn't receive its fair share back. Whether that is done through Scott Fitzgerald or Robin Voss or whoever it is, the city and the county are not getting the resources necessary to take care of what needs to be taken care of in the city. Uh, do you feel that the city should remove all lead laterals and plumbing for homeowners based on their ability to pay and given 10 years to pay, not just when there is a break in the system? Either one of you. Mandating, you know, uh, you know in, in cases where that would work, sure, let, you know, if people are willing to do that and it's not going to create, you know, a hardship. Um, but, you know, every, you know, we have the one thing where we have to separate, you know, the rainwater from our gutters, you know, from the sewer systems. Um, you know, that's one, that's mandated, that's one cost. You know, that's what, $10,000, give or take a home, or, you know, plus or minus, depending how much it costs to do excavation or, you know, how you're going to do that. Um, you know, I use a very simple solution that probably is 95%, you know, effective. Um, but each one of these things makes it more expensive to live in the city so I would really favor trying to work on the root causes of why we're in the state you know we're in trying to grow the economy um, you know trying to attract business trying to involve the community you know that's here because they're the ones who are living through it you know let them benefit you know from some of the growth um, you know and then try to get some of that you know out of it uh, I don't think I would mandate it I think I would take it on a case-by-case -case basis uh, because when you get something from the city or the state or the federal government and it's official, that can be scary. Um, and that, that's true whether you're in a means to pay it you know, or not. And one of the things I hear in the field when talking to people is that you know, everything is changing, taxes go up, they go down. Um, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it, a couple places it did for a little while, but now they're going back up. So you know, predictability and trying to manage change in a way that people can actually afford it. Do you feel that the city should remove all lead laterals and plumbing from homeowners based on their ability to pay and given 10 years to pay, not just when there is a break in the system? The 10 years to pay, you said based on their ability to pay. That's correct. And then you, I don't understand what you're saying when you say in 10 years to pay. Well, part. this, this is a list of questions that were given to Okay, me. well. So if there's I, an issue with. So, so I'm, I'm not fully clear on the 10 years to pay part. Um, if you're saying their ability to pay, you're saying their ability to pay and then getting 10 years to pay. Is that what you're well, let, well, let's take the 10 years away again. Okay. I was given so, these questions and that's what this says. So if we're hung up on that, let's move to the next question. So my, it was your question. So you want to clarify your question? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Right now, there's a, what's happening with the city is that they've got a program that's going like this, in which if, if, uh, one, of the, if one of the pipes breaks, they pay for most of it, and then the, the homeowner would pay $1,600 over 10 years. So that's why I had it in that way. Uh, but right now, it's only if it breaks. Right. Whereas I'm saying, no, just fix it. And then still, for most homeowners, $1,600 over 10 years, they could still kind of handle that's that. That's more doable. Okay, so you're so basically, if I understand the question right, you're saying, do you feel like it should just be um, if it breaks, or should it just be let's go in and let's do go it. in and fix it? Thank yeah. you. All right, thank you for the clarification, Dr. McManus, of the question. I believe that we should fix the lead laterals. I think it's long overdue. I think that we need to do that. I think the um, the fact that the laterals haven't been fixed, it, and to go to what Paul said earlier, that there is no um, uh, prohibition of lead being used in your faucets and your plumbing that's within your house, there's a problem not only in the laterals, but there are problems within our homes. And so I believe that we should prioritize that, we should address that issue, and if there is a way for us to do it, whether it is in bonding, tip, whatever that way may be, uh, the process of giving people over 10 years, whatever that may be, we need to prioritize that. Budgets are moral documents, and I believe that we should be putting in our budget the issue of being able to address the lead laterals, and we shouldn't wait till they break. We should be trying to go and address the issues and to go to something that was said earlier. It should be based on you know, where the concentrations are, where the challenges are, and then 
you know, trying to move from there. Okay, so what we're going to try to do is speed up the process. We've got a lot of questions. We're going to take questions from the audience. We're almost coming to the top of the hour. Uh, so if we could expedite the answers, please. Should people who rent out property be responsible for making sure their homes are lead free? Should the city remove the lead laterals and plumbing and then build them over a 10 year period? I think the lead should come out. There, there's no question. It should be done very smartly. It can be prioritized you know, based on what the you know, actual threat is or as well as we can understand the threat because you know, if you look at the goosenecks, the things that come off of the, you know, the water mains, there can be deposits hidden. So going in and saying, inspect it, look at it, prioritize. You know, sometimes you can do more damage, like we said earlier, um, you know, by going in and perturbing these systems. So one has to be extremely careful because that can just shoot it up to be, you know, your water is now toxic waste, even worse than what Flint was. Um, so, you know, it really, um, can you repeat what you're looking for in this time? Whether or not rental. Oh yeah, rental with respect to rental. Sure, I mean you know when you when I rented properties you know over the years or stayed places you know I just assumed you know that my landlord was giving me the safest possible environment and I tried to do you know the least amount of uh, you know damage or you know try to keep it in as good of condition as possible. So yeah, there should be a uh, The city city should require it, and then we should also work with the landlords, the property owners, uh, however it's coming out to make sure that. You know, it's being managed in a way that's not going to put, you know, that property owner, you know, out of business, unduly burden them. But at the same time, the people staying in those houses, regardless of where they are, what part of town, what neighborhood, they have to be protected. Um, and I think you can do that if the city is more proactive, uh, is looking, you know, from a perspective of uh, what can we do to help you manage your life, you know, or manage your problems if you want it. If everything was going well, sure, just stay out. If you're going to go in and replace that lead, you know, uh, you know, please check with the city because, you know, if a property owner does something on their side and the water is stagnant in the pipes, you can get a back diffusion to other properties. So, um, you know, it's really something that I think the city and government in general is in an excellent position to help manage and oversee. There are some things that really only, you know, only government can do for us or that can help us, you know, facilitate. Um, all of us look towards government, you know, for that type of thing. It has a tremendous amount of information, a tremendous amount of expertise in hundreds of departments at every level you know, of government. And I think it's just being underutilized. It's being falsely restricted you know, by, you know, in many cases, law. If you give me the legal code, either ordinances, state level, or federal statutes, I can do anything with it. And that's not to you know, mean that you know, uh, it's just there's so many of them. They're so complicated that you know, if you want to do something, I'm sure that Lena, and I, Lena could do the same thing. It's just you tell us what you want done, and we'll get it done for you. But is that what we should be doing? Somebody like Lena, somebody like me, we're going to have a check and balance on us you know, naturally. And that's why I like working with you know, the state, you know, with, the, you know, with the congressional reps, the senators, with anybody that's going to help us solve these problems. There's so much infrastructure that hasn't been addressed you know, for years, and, you know, for 20, 30, 40, 50 years um, that we really just have to take so, you know, a new approach to it, I think. All right. Um, I have actually a piece of legislation that, like with lead paint, you have to have um, a tenant sign that, you know, you don't have lead paint, you know, uh, on your property or, you know, that type of thing. I think the same thing should exist in regards to lead laterals. And um, that legislation uh, is not going to get a hearing. <laughs> I can assure you of that. Um, I believe, like anything, and this goes to really the question before and the reality of poverty in this community and the lack of home ownership. You, ha you have less than 40% home ownership of individuals who live in the city, less than 8% of home ownership of people of color, African Americans in particular. Um, and so you're dealing mostly with rental property. You know, the Department of Neighborhood Services pretty much only acts react from a react reaction kind of, you know, way. So if we make it a way for 
um, those things to be done and to build those property owners, that would be great. My problem is, is that many of those individuals that are owning uh, rental property are not always paying their taxes. They're not always fixing their properties the way that they need to. And so when we get done, that is potentially going to fall right back on the smaller group of individuals who are um, homeowners actually in the community that are paying their taxes. In the end, we have to deal with the issue. We have to remove the lead. Do I believe that there are some ways that we can do that? I do, and I believe that we should use everything from rem removing the lateral and the issues that are within the home, using some worker training programs, as well as some capacity building programs to make it possible so that we don't have two companies only that are contracting for you know, the removal of, of laterals in this community. And I think that if we do that, it goes back to something that Paul said actually, which is it is a collaborative way that we begin to address the issues. Why can we not train some individuals to do this work? Right. It, it's no reason that we cannot train our people in our community who are unemployed to be able to do this work. Right. We have plenty of city properties that we could use as training grounds. And so, Long story short, we need to remove the lead laterals, not just in the homes. You know, we need to address whatever lead plumbing exists also in buildings that this city owns. So we're gonna take two more questions off this list and then we're gonna to go to the audience. Uh, uh, the next question, shortly after FLAC and get the lead out presented to the steering and rules committee in February 2019, professors from UWM, Zilber School of Public Health, attempted to discredit and stop flack and get the lead out by writing a letter to the Common Council in which they stated that the research being conducted by flack and get the lead out had potential to harm, uh, potential to harm our community. The Common Council was compelled, however, to allow flat and get the lead out to present a final presentation to the Public Health and Safety Committee in March of 2019. Long question. Have you ever viewed the research and actions by FLAC and get the lead out as potentially harmful to the community as the UWM School of Public Health stated? Who or which departments do you believe have in actuality caused the serious harm that our community is experiencing in terms of extremely high blood lead levels and seriously high infant mortality rates? So first, I have reviewed uh, the work that FLAC and Get the Lead Out has done. As the water capital of the world, I cannot understand why we have not pulled all the water experts together and uh, been able to figure out how we could you know, address this issue in a more rapid way. And that would be something that I would do, including some of the companies that have everything from filtration systems to you name it. I think we need all hands on deck in this regard and being the water capital of the world, I'm not exactly certain why we've not done that, number one. Number two, the health department has been a major um, uh, problem in this, but I want to be clear, it wasn't just the health department, it was a collaborative of the health department, the um, public works department, and DNS. All of those were departments, as stated by former Commissioner Bevan Baker, that would come together to talk about these issues around lead in the water. And t uh, the mayor is the person that all of those individuals worked for and was informed. And so part of what, what I believe is that the lack of management uh, or mismanagement, um, the what seems to be flat corruption, because let's be clear, the health department is under criminal investigation. The Baird administration is under criminal investigation for how they handled the issues around lead. And so why that's not in the media more, why we don't know, I guess, the same reason that we don't know why the Register of Deeds took $2.5 million, got to move to Florida, sell his house, and get his pension, and we haven't heard about it. But we hear everything about Michael Bonds and Willie Wade and blah, blah, blah. So 
What I want to say is that I believe the way that the administration has handled the health department coupled with the others, not to mention when Dr. McManus came to the health department, all of the computers, all of the computers was disappeared from the office under the pretense that that's the only department that had a virus when she came. So the criminal investigation is now up to a criminal investigation at the state level. Whatever or whoever committed the crimes of knowing what was going on did not address the issues. Some individuals were fired because they were shown to have um, some race biases for the very individuals that had tested positive for lead. I mean, these are issues that we don't know enough about because there is not transparency and inclusion in this regard. So who? I say the buck stops with the person that is the executive. The executive is Tom Barrett. Nice guy is what he's known to be. But I don't think it's really nice if children are being poisoned, if we know and we are not addressing the lead laterals, if it's not in your budget, and more importantly, if your health department is not addressing the issues. And so my question is, after time as a state rep, a state senator, and in Congress in 16 years as your mayor, I don't know what he's going to do in the next four that he could not have done in the last 16. So I believe that the problem is the individual that I'm running against and the health department and the other departments, DNS and DPW. I think the way I always try to approach things, you know, not always successful, nobody is, is if there's a problem, you know, I ask myself a series of questions. Uh, I'll always take, you know, input. I'll always see what's there. But sometimes, as Lena mentioned, there's a lot at stake. There's people's careers. You know, there's potential criminal investigations. Um, and, you know, Sure, you know, uh, th that's kind of an area as an executive I try to avoid, you know, the least amount of problems, you know, the better. And that's kind of a, a, a you know, judiciary, you know, uh, from my point of view. I want to try and solve the problems. If I'm not getting the answers, if there's blood, if, if there's lead in the blood that shouldn't be there and really shouldn't be at all. Um, you know, right, right, well, well, no, I guess if eventually, right, because that, you know, that's where I think the trigger was for, you know, what's going, no, it's okay. What's, you know, what's going wrong is then I'm going to ask where is it coming from? I'm, there's a certain amount of lead that's in the environment, you know, anyway, but that's not trying to pass the buck saying that's where this is. We also know that there are lead pipes in the ground, you know, fixtures and homes and that you know it's a very complex problem and there are other problems like pathogens on top of it you know that uh, have nothing to do with lead that you know sometimes it's balancing you know you have so much amount of money to do something with and that's where we would bring you know innovation um, I would try to include as ever, you know you know Tom Tony as much as possible um, because you know there are reasons to do that you know I've looked at it and I think there's a way to get from where we are right now to where we should be it takes a certain amount of time I favor getting those laterals out getting the lead out as soon as we can, but we have to realize that Madison did just that, and it still didn't remove all of their lead problem, partly partially because it was in plumbing and, you know, uh, you know, any number of other things, you know, uh, as well. I didn't dig into it in that level, but sure, you know, if something's, you know, violently wrong, you know, in a department, um, then, you know, people are going to decide, but I would try to solve the problem before it got to that point because that's when 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 you have issues of punishing people more and more and more it can actually be far more counterproductive than just trying to solve the problem um, you know and put a new measure and you know, a new system in place uh, and again that's where I think working you know with other people with other people that know something because this is such a big problem that it would be silly you know to dismiss the state the you know our congressional our you know senatorial representatives uh, you know the common council the, the department heads um, you know again I mean it, you know I look at it from um, bring everything in then, you know, if, if it's an emergency, then sure, you have to move quick and you may make some mistakes, you may not get everything right, but at least you're going to be functioning, you know, in the public trust. You know, these offices are all public servants and sometimes you have to make trade-offs between who's there and who, you know, might be harmed. Um, you know, I don't want to harm a business that's going to put 200, 300, or even five people, you know, out of work. But just as Lena mentioned involving the community, 
that's actually one of the preferred models that people are using you know, across you know, the United States. And just in Wisconsin alone, I think the estimate is that it costs us maybe $7 billion, give or take, from the children that have been exposed. And they're projecting, I believe, the estimate of law, yeah, well, at least, well, that's seven billion is, I think, in more direct costs, uh, seven billion. Uh, and then it's $21 billion lost profitability, lost wages and earning, you know, and all the extra frustration. That feeds back into maybe violence, juvenile delinquency, um, you know, trying to get those interventive programs early, you know, trying to do something about it. So you have to, you know, uh, again, you know, idle hands, devil's workshop, that kind of thing. That's why uh, programs for children, young adults, people, you know, who want to do something else. You know, anybody in this room could solve any problem, and I don't want to have a bias against anybody for any reason. Um, sure, don't be stupid, be very cautious about it, um, but, you know, the answer, you know, short is try to solve the problem, and this happens to me, you know, almost every day where I have almost no information, yet I have to get to a solution, and you just have to think about it. What's the smartest, best way to proceed? And then, sure, listen to everybody, try not to cut anybody out of the loop, but also, you know, I would just know where to go, to what experts to listen to, you know, if, if I didn't have a solution ready. And I probably would have some type of architecture or a rough sketch of where to go with it. Uh, and then I would say I didn't meet to those bones. And if I was wrong on a point, we would just correct it. So last question for me, and then we'll go to the audience. If you guys will please kind of stand, walk up to the microphone if you have a question to comment. Uh, now is the time. But is it safe to say that the lead issue is more than a city or state issue? It is, is it a national issue? And should it be addressed on a national level? And why are we not hearing people on a national level talk about something that is impacting cities across the nation and rural areas? Yes, it is larger than a city issue. Yes, it should be addressed at the national level. And for uh, clarity, U.S. Senator Tammy Baldwin did do uh, a bill that did attempt to address the issue. Uh, I was supportive of that. Um, and I do believe that, you know, in the end, we have to be creative in our community also because it does have a direct correlation and UW-Milwaukee did a study that has a direct correlation to violence uh, and others have done studies in, in that regard. So this cost that um, Paul, and with all due respect, Paul, I believe it's even larger than that when you consider the cost that exists related to violence, when it's uh, special needs. Um, uh, in, in Flint in particular, they're having a high rise in special special education and special needs of their young people. We've had that problem, and we've had that problem more than likely because of the lack of adequate management by our city in particular with the lead issue. One of the things that lead can do is hamper, I've you know, made some notes last night, um, is hampers brain development. So, you know, if you're impeding a, a brain, you know, a human brain, um, you know, that's good, that really, you know, it, you know it, it's really, you know, it, it's extremely dangerous and it's really, you know, an issue that, you know, how long are you going to have to deal with it? You're going to have to deal with it for 70, 80, 90, 100 years, you know, the person is there. Right, I mean, you know, it, it's a real serious issue. Uh, you know, the correlation with aggression, even if that's not considered to be proof, that's scary enough. Uh, once you start seeing correlations in their first, second, third, fourth order, um, you've got a problem and you really have to deal with it. Um, you know, juvenile incarceration, uh, setting the standard of what's going to be in the future. You have to have something to intercede far earlier, you know, than that. All right. So uh, we're going to open it up to the audience. Again, if you have any questions or comments, now is the time. Yes, sir. Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Winston. I'm a first class resident. I want to thank um, for this opportunity to be here to hear um, potential candidates talk about what um, they see that they're going to commit to do um, to resolve in this important issue. I want to definitely, because it's my first time meeting this individual, um, Nebraska, um, but I definitely want to thank um, uh, Senator Taylor for her work. Um, and um, one of the last things I've seen that I was very impressed of exposing the water department 
um, um, excuse that they can't remove lead laterals because they don't have policing powers when actually no one has policing powers but the police, the fire department, and the health department. So they actually lied in front of the state um, board, and she was able to bring that out, you know, um, and I hope that is something that we can really take advantage of. But I have some information that I know I haven't given I'm not sure if I've given to, I mean, I know I haven't given to you, but I definitely filed with the city's clerks on this in regarding to what you're talking about, the cost, that the Wisconsin Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention and Control Handbook for local public health departments. Um, Wisconsin Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program, Wisconsin Department of Health Services. Um, it states in its manual that each, each dollar spent on preventing lead poisoning results in a return of investment of 17 to $221 when the cost of lead poisoning, including health care, education, loss in earnings, and crime, are shown. So, so, so do you have a question? So my question, I want to bring out the... Cause the I know, we got, we got other people. You so. mentioned comments, so I want to... Educate, I don't know how many people knew that. How many people knew that? I mean, that's... It's, I don't think a lot of... Because I don't hear it in the discussion that we... The money is there. Number one. So what are you going to do in regards to the money being there? Number two um, is dealing with the fact that right now the city has a program of extorting um, the removal or the because you're not really removing the lead is actually putting in new lines in houses by the metering department going to houses that they know have lead laterals and they're saying they're going to change the meter upgraded, but now because the city council made an ordinance that you can't touch the, the lead, now they say, oh, we can't change your meter until you remove the lead ladder, and they're putting it on homeowners. This is the, the, the backdoor thing that they're doing to homeowners. I do have issues with the, the emergency plan because there's things in there that are um, very deceptive. And then the third thing is seeing that um, and we just have new reports coming out with the loss of black home ownership in the inner city and the home ownership in general in the city. Where we have more outside investors gobbling up the houses in the, in, in the inner city. So yes. the, the third question is, is it some type of legislation or something we can do? Because there is a, con, a, a consent form that when you sell a house that you have to say is lead. So these people buying houses should be responsible, especially outsiders, since we got preferential treatment that they should be removing the lead laterals because they're not a homeowner, which when you're a homeowner, it's a different type of situation when you put yourself in a hazard than when you purchase a property and you have a renter. Then the landlord is responsible for those lead laterals. That we need to take advantage of the more than they say is almost $400 million that has left the city of Milwaukee through outside investors. And so the three questions, again, the last one is looking at solutions for making new, the, all these investors coming in, remove these lead laterals, as re, is somewhat required by law that you uh, account for that. Can I interrupt one minute? For, uh, you brought up an excellent point about, you know, where the money is. Not that outside money, you know, is bad and that some of it leaving is necessarily bad, but me personally, I want, no, right, I want to see you guys, you know, people who are in the community benefit as much or more. Um, so I want to make you guys, you know, the owners, you know, the investors, um, because you're going to be able to see it, you know, and then fix. So, so basically, you know, I have a lot of really interesting ideas, you know, in terms of dealing with just that issue so that there's less you know, outside money coming in and leaving. Uh, don't say no to it when it, you know, adds something, but basically I have things where I think we can make you guys, you know, the, the capitalists. Yeah. Well, you know, again, the people who are here, percent, wherever so they make is. Make sure the questions are clear. Please. Making the issue on foreign investors responsible when they take on the property that they remove the lead because they have to be aware now that it's lead. Before, the owner can say, I didn't know it was lead. But now we've been talking oh, about know, it, sure, it's a lesson, sure. yeah, they so they have to inform the new person, and so they should be forced to remove that. Um, that's, that's the third one. The second one is stopping the, the, the city of Milwaukee from manipulating um, because they created a new ordinance where you can't touch lead at all. It used to be we could repair and fix it, but now you can't touch it at all, and that the metering department is targeting houses that they know have lead laterals that they know they can't remove that then they're forcing the owners to remove the lead in order to be in compliance with upgrading the meter. And then the first one is looking at really educating people and focus on how for every dollar spent 
on removing lead that we have a return on investment of 17 to 221 hundred dollars um, in return and see that number was just from 2014 that number has to be a lot greater now and we should have a lot more research thank you very but, much but, but with number one educating you say are we supportive of the education of people that one dollar to 221 so we can That's stop talking about we don't have money because it is money we okay so money. okay so thank, thank you, you. Amen. thank you um cool. you want to respond yes Thank you so much. So the first thing, um, I do understand the issue of about 60% of our homes or you know something like that, more than 50% are owned by individuals who are, as you called them, what did you say, foreigners or outside, outside investors? City, so yeah, yes, yes, the the, they're foreigners as you stated um, and holding individuals accountable in that sense. Um, this goes back to the question I would argue that uh, Dr. McManus also asked, which is even for homeowners, is there a mechanism? Because I would argue that, you know, I'm not going to count your money for you. And so even though some individuals may be, pro you know, have rental properties, I don't know their ability to be able to go in and fix you know the laterals so I do believe that there needs to be a mechanism for individuals to be able to do that I think that that's very similar to the question that was asked earlier but do I believe especially when you have someone like uh, my, my father calls some people call him boulder man and my father calls him rock man um, Barada owns several houses you know buildings within the community can I finish Excuse me, one other thing I want I'm, what I'm saying is that you have to inform the buyer I, I heard Sir. you yeah that's what I'm saying I, 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 I heard you, and so, but, but you required, you asked for two things, and so whether or not requiring them to do something is the portion that I was answering now, and so I'm saying to you that I believe that it is important and we need to get the lead out. I'm also saying to you that I'm conscious of the fact that individuals may or may not have that revenue and that the mechanism that was spoke about that I believe that we should make sure that we're having a solution in that way. I also believe sweat equity and work worker training is also a way in order to be able to do some things. And then in regards to legislation that requires you to give notice, I mentioned earlier that there is a form and requirement to say something on lead paint, but there is nothing that says that on lead laterals or, sorry, there is nothing that, okay, Solana, can you help me? I don't know what I did, okay. That's okay. There, there is nothing that says that for lead laterals or for lead plumbing that's within a home. And so I mentioned that I did draft legislation in that regard, but I don't believe that it'll ever get a hearing. And so that would mean that I do agree that there should be some notice for individuals, not just individuals that go to rent, but also if someone goes to buy. And I believe the city could make a requirement, but they do not for individuals that buy city homes and so that's your number three. Your number two is stopping, so this policy that they're doing of you feel like they're targeting in particular homes that have lead laterals and then saying, we're not, you need to remove your meter, but your meter can't be done until you do your lead lateral removers and then individuals can be put in a vicious cycle that potentially could put them, I, I assume, in a place of being able to lose their homes. This is, a, this is something that I believe, um, you know, I wish that even uh, Attorney Vince Bobbitt I know is here and is running for city attorney. I believe that this also is a legal issue in regards to how the city attorney's office will handle some of those issues. So I would hate to know that there is a targeted process, but I believe that that's possible. I mean, I believe it's totally possible that they're doing that. And I believe that that is inappropriate, no different than I believe it's inappropriate that individuals are getting like major, you know, um, violations, major um, tax bills or whatever, and then losing their home. You know, some of the stuff that's happening in that regard. I believe that we should put some programs and um, policies in place to be able to help individuals to be able to stay in their homes and in their communities. And I believe that I'm going to go back to the sweat equity. What I mean by sweat equity is you know how Habitat for Humanity works? You know, you can put some hours in and you can become a homeowner. I believe the same kind of thing should be able to work 
for individuals who need to get training in the community to be able to help people who are in a situation that cannot do those things. I, we're a community. We are in this together. And so I believe that we should utilize it in that way. You know, I was jokingly um, uh, said during um, God Rest His Soul, Caesar Stinson's uh, homegoing celebration, we had a citation to read for him. And I said, I can't even see it. So I turned to Jason Fields and said, you need to read it. And Jason said, my eyes can't read. Let's let the young guy read it. And so Representative Bowen um, read it. And I say that to say young folks need to get some training and skill because in our schools we do not have pathways for them to be prepared for work. We have our employers who are saying that people in our community are not ready for work. So I believe that there is a way to pair those things together in order to make Employ Milwaukee work, for example, even more effective because we've had four leaders in the last three years and so that kind of mismanagement under Barrett doesn't work okay. and then educating okay so you want to respond sir sure um, one of the things that I would do uh, first of all if I was in mayor tomorrow or elected we'll work together on solving all these issues until you're happy with them because you brought up some really excellent points uh, one of the things that I already know and some of the things we can't let you know legal minutia stand in the way of public health issues or people's happiness, their ability to stay in their home. So I want everybody to stay in their home. I want to find good solutions to do it. And we can find them together. Some of them will come from me. Some of them will come from you. You know the problem excellently. So yes, you know nobody should be targeted because it's just you, it, it's not a fair fight, right? It, 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 there's no way we can win any one of us against you know government. I would I mean, if Vince is an, I would probably keep Vince very busy, but I'd also let Vince do his job, saying this is what I'd like to achieve. Can you please find a way you know to do this? Um, you know, and then he would come back saying, well, this is difficult. And we would just keep iterating until we got a solution that was good for everybody. You know, everybody. You know, um, it, and it's absolutely a community. We can't see anything. Uh, um, yeah, educate people, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, no targeting. Uh, and then what's this last one? I'll just... Yeah, I mean, sure, you know, as things are being transferred, just make sure that everybody's aware. Uh, you know, I'm not opposed to seeing something in legislation, uh, you know, to require that. Uh, you know, I want to make sure that there's a, you know, a fail safe in that so that, you know, um, we're not going to put somebody out of business, but we're going to deal with the problems. So, so what's the next question? Yes, ma'am. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Terry Wiggins, if I can say it. Um, and my question is this. When the DNC comes to Milwaukee in July, um, what will you be able to brag about that Milwaukee has done or is doing to address our lead issue? I think we've started to understand the problem. We just, if you look and do a uh, you know, review of what's out there, um, you know, just go on the Safari, Google, you, you're going to see that, you know, we are doing things. We're just not moving fast enough. And some of the reasons why we're not moving fast enough relate to that, you know, there are, you know, various lines that you can't cross legally. That's where I think the city attorney, uh, and they have an amazing staff where we can help resolve some of those issues, at least point it, you know, in the right direction. So the, one of the earlier questions are dealing with what is the level of this problem, it's it's actually, you know, it's local, state, and it is federal. It might even be international. So we all really have, you know, to work together, you know, on, you know, on these solutions. Well, at, first of all, as mayor, I would only have a short amount of time that I would have been in office. So in that short amount of time, however, I would want to pull all of our plumbers together and be able to talk to them and talk about how can we build capacity and why have they not been seeking contracts. I would also want to change what we are doing and try to do whatever I can in regards to the WIC program to make sure uh, that we're not only doing a filter but trying to make sure that those individuals are getting water um, in order to be able to uh, address their infants that are you know, consuming the water. I would also brag about the fact that we have done filters, but I don't believe that we've done them effectively, nor are we making sure that people have adequately put them in. So I believe that we should be working more with um, uh, uh, the water place uh, that I've 
was on the board, Metropolitan Sewage District, thank you, and um, uh, MMSD, that's what I was trying to think of, and working with them to try to help to build more uh, pipelines for or pathways for employment in water and so that our young people are knowing so that we are building capacity of individuals to work in the industry also. And then the last thing um, that I would like to be able to do is to say that we've at least started a program to address our own city-owned properties so that whether it is someone buying our city-owned properties or whether it is the properties that we have, whether it is our schools or whether it's a uh, any building, whatever it is, that we at least have a program that is helping us to address the properties that we own as a city. And if we can say that we've at least began the processes of doing that, I think that that is commendable, but I think it'll be even better when we can you know, show that we've done it and now we're getting results. So we're into the last few minutes of this program. We've got four, four more speakers. Can I add one more little thing to Go that? Ahead. One thing that I think we would do is, I think we're in a position, an excellent position, to not only solve the problem for us, you know, with respect to the DNC coming to town, is that we're gonna create a model that other people are going to be able to copy and make their own. Um, and there are so many opportunities. Um, you know, when I go through the city, you know, so I see the, when I see the blank lots, I'm seeing places where, wow, not only can we solve those problems, but we can also solve some of the parking problems so we can make it easier on Department of Sanitation to plow the streets, you know, in the winter. Uh, so there's a huge, we're really set up in so, a beautiful place. So let's try to get these four people in. Yes, sir. And while you're stepping up, I just want to add more, one more thing if I could. I would also, ma'am, partner with other cities that are doing the work. And I've already spoke to like the mayor of Flint and others to be able to talk about what things work well. Yes, sir. All right, uh, Senator Taylor, uh, Mr. Rasky, um, my name is Robert Penner. Uh, I'll keep this pretty brief. Um, so considering uh, the history of lead and water in Milwaukee, the mandate, which was started in 1872, went all the way through 1950, you had to install lead pipes in your home. Uh, we have old housing stock here in Milwaukee, and we've even built new houses on properties that have an old lead pipe in the ground and reconnected to it. So considering that mandate, considering the profiteering that came from it, um, considering uh, that the city installed many of these pipes through the Milwaukee Waterworks, uh, and then also considering the change in ownership uh, definitions of the pipes starting in 1991, um, should the homeowner have any responsibility to pay for these lead laterals to be removed? Wow. I don't think so. <laughs> Even yeah, over yeah. 10 years, $1,600 is not affordable yeah. for people. So should, the, should there be any financial onus on, on the homeowner or should it be all the city? The least amount possible, you know, and, and you know, we should be able to do, uh, you know, an awful lot more and you're absolutely right, you know, based on, you know, the history that, you know, we're, we're talking about. Um, sure, you know, we'll find the money, we'll find a way and, you know, it's not always, you know, the money, you can, you know, we were talking about innovative solutions to doing it. So, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, every time, you know, there's an issue, it always seems to be the homeowner or the taxpayer, and it really does hurt, you know, uh, you know, everybody, no matter, you know, no matter their position. So the least amount of burden, sure, I think we could, I think we, the, the bottom line is we can find ways to do it without bar burdening the homeowner in any way. Uh, and be very, very smart about it, or put it in a place and do it in a way where, you know, we can actually bring taxes down, not raise them, and have it be more predictable. So Milwaukee is a more stable place to own a home, to run a business. That's very important when you're taking, you know, when you're, when you're getting private money or you're trying, or you're borrowing money to start a business is the predictability insofar as possible. So yeah, you make a great point. You mentioned from 1972 to 1950, it was a mandate. And then after the mandate, there was no prohibition until what year? 1963. Exactly. And so between 1950 and 1963, homes were still built. Yes. And then one of the, the reason that I say that is because that's one of the reasons that you can know that there are more than 70,000 homes. Because during the time that there was no prohibition, it still was being done. And so that's the first thing I wanna say. And, and I say that because the state played a role in mandate. So I believe the state also has a role because the mandate was on homeowners that you had to do it. So do I believe that homeowners have a responsibility? You know, I understand the argument that you've said of why they don't. I partly agree with you. 
And the reason that I do is because it was mandated that this had to be done. So I didn't, for lack of a better say it, have a choice, right? Um, it's kind of like, uh, you know, saying you got to do it and, you know, what, we, what the state often does to the cities or the counties, mandating you got to do this and then we have to be stuck with the bill. But I want to say this to you. Whether the homeowners do it over 10 years, and I do believe that that's slightly more manageable, even though that's still difficult for people who have fixed in incomes, but whether the homeowner pays for it or if the city pays for it, the homeowners pay the property taxes that fund the dollars, so in the end, it's, for lack of a better say, it falling back on the homeowners. So we're all in this together. What I'm talking about are solutions that will help to train our people to use this crisis that we have, for them to get worker training, for them to get capacity building in businesses because businesses create jobs for us to be able to deal with it from a health issue and deal with it you know also from a public safety issue these are all issues that are intertwined so in the end in whatever way it is we need to move so that we can get the lead out and what we need is to bring our water experts to bring our plumbing experts bring those individuals to the table something that has not happened based on the individuals that i've spoken to who are experts in the area and keep doing what you're doing. You're doing like the same kind of research that I and Lena do. We just do it on our own. We look into the problem. We understand it. Then we, you know, get a solution. So, and that's one thing that I know would change with Lena and I is that we would be working with you far more and really understanding that and you know applying big data in a way that isn't going to crush or hurt you or say do what you do what we tell you to do. Um, you know, it's more about trying to make everybody, you know, take some pressure, take the stress out of your lives. Uh, and that tracks right back into what you're saying. Grace and peace uh, to everybody that's here. My name is Desiree Brown. And first, I just want to uh, thank you, Paul and Lena, for agreeing to do a debate um, for the community to hear from you and be able to ask questions. We don't often get that. I want to thank you, Lena, for being accessible all the time and transparent. Uh, I want to thank you for showing up at, what do you call it, school, uh, when it's time to look for schools. I want to thank you for showing up at different forums throughout the city and holding them and hosting them and coming on the radio and giving us vital information that we should know about. Just being truthful with the community that we be able to make a decision based on that. So I, I do want to thank you both for sure for coming tonight. And the question I have for the both of you is because in my opinion, the city has gone through a demise under Tom Barrett, the mayor. And one of the biggest and most pressing issues is the lead laterals and the lead that's affecting my people, our community. Do you both, or do you think that that's the reason that Tom Barrett, the mayor, of the city of Milwaukee for the last 16 years did not appear because he knows that his administration is corrupt because it all starts with the top and this lead issue. That's my, that's my question. Oh, one more. No, 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 I'm not finished. Because in a leader, in a leader, I want them to come to the table of the things that ail the community. I don't want you to come with a notebook and say, I looked this up last night. I want my leader to know and value the human lives that they will be elected to govern. Thank you. Well, the first thing I want to say, Ms. Brown, is thank you so much for um, the recognition of my visibility in the community and the way that I've led um, as a senator, as a state representative, as a lawyer who practiced for a decade in this community is I believe in inclusiveness. I'm a, I'm a servant leader, you know, is the way that, um, that I try, you know, to always lead. And I will always do that. 
I don't just do or help people who are in my district. Uh, as my staff always tells me, um, you know, can't you say no to people that's not in your district? And if people come to us, you know, my desire is to make sure that what we do is help people navigate. I feel like we are the bridge between people and, and their government. Um, in regards to your question um, of why uh, the mayor did not appear, I can't speak for why the way mayor did not appear. Um, I do feel like he can run, but he cannot hide. He can't hide from his record. He cannot hide from his record of what he has not done on lead. He cannot hide from his record of the number of young people who had been tested and were not um, provided with the services that were needed. He cannot hide for the fact that he had staff that has not been fired to this day that still work for the city who um, had some, uh, some, some role in that work not being done. Um, so my position is I don't know why the mayor is not here, but what you can see from me is that no matter what the issues are, I will be present. That's right, I will be available. Thank I will be accessible. Even when the issues are hard, and I will give examples that there have been times that people have not agreed maybe with some of the legislation that I've been a part of. But even in those times, I've come to the community so the community could share with me how they feel and explain what my research did and why I made the choices that I made. And so we're in this together. When I'm mayor, you're mayor. We're mayor together because I'm not gonna be able to do this alone. This is gonna take all of us bringing our skills and talents to the table. We are not the north side and the south side. That's We're right. Milwaukee, That's right. and it's all neighborhoods. We are our neighborhoods. That's what makes us the strongest portion of the, the strongest thing that we can be. We are not just downtown. Right. So to answer that question, the last question you had, I lost that question. What was that last one? Do you remember? Okay, well, I hope I've answered your question. Thanks, Lena. Uh, one of the things that I'd always be, and it, it holds true tonight, um, one of my friends uh, who know, does a lot of security work told me, you don't always have to tell everybody everything about you. But I will promise that I will always answer the questions, you know, uh, you know as far as I can, as far as I know the truth, because sometimes you don't know it. So, no, you know, I don't, you know, know why time isn't here, you know, tonight. Um, if it was my problem, um, I would still be here, you know, say anything you want, because, you know, it doesn't always feel good. But a person is going to learn from that. And we're, uh, just as Lena said, we're working together. Um, we're part of a team, you know, and we have to solve problems together and try and avoid them. Um, you know, it's 16 years is too long, 10 years is too long, five years is too long. Uh, the sooner the, I, it's one thing that if I couldn't get a, a, a acceptable solution in the private sector, we would just do it, you know, internal, you know, to the city as best as we could. Um, no, we've got we've got three other callers, and we're just about out of time. I mean, uh, you're not on the radio, Earl. Yeah, so, so, so you have a question Dr. to come, sir. Dr. Taylor. I want to acknowledge you, and Mr. Rasky, how are you? I heard Zelensky on the radio today. He yes, said sir. All of the correct things, but I don't know who he is. Haven't seen him before. And I'm, my feelings are terribly hurt that our mayor is not here in our area. I have been an educator for over 50 years. And the solution to all of our problems is not money. I mean, we have the money, it's just misdirected. And but everything that needs to be done in this city, in these areas that aren't being uh, maintained, we have this, the people to do it and the money. I have, I have worked with uh, Habitat for Humanity. I worked at the SDC and I recently went to SDC's open house. I've worked at Northcott. And I think, I know that the solution to most of our problems can be solved with nonprofits. That would redirect the money into the city. I learned lately that in Florida, before the city takes over a house, they put a lien on the property. And the, city, the people still own the property, but they do whatever needs to be done, and the city owns the property. And that's uh, revenue, incoming revenue. Right now, I 
got a, I got a citation to do the lead in, a, in one of my properties. It cost me $1,600, which is not bad. And I think they put it on the, re, on the uh, tax, on my tax bill. Anybody could handle that. And I've said for the longest, while they were talking about the lead problem, they should have been refitting some lead laterals. They could have been doing that while they were studying it. They know it's there. You don't have to study to find it's there. Just do it. Ongoingly, all the time they've been talking about it, they should have been doing it. And they wouldn't have the problem that they have now. And uh, uh, So do, do you have a question? I made an observation. Okay. And good to you, Lena. All right, sir. One of the things I want to say in regards to the, um, to the statement that you made is they should, instead of talking about it, you said they should just have been doing it. Well, actually, most of the time they were fighting the facts and trying to be in denial about it. And so they were forced into a situation, for those of you who may not know, it was at a Marquette forum with Mike Goucher. Um, Robert Miranda deserves a huge, huge shout out, and he deserves to be recognized by this city that what he did was press the mayor that day. And that was the first day that the mayor, and he didn't do it at first even in that form. He denied that we had an issue until um, Robert asked, would he recommend that the baby, that individuals give the water to babies? And that was the first time that the mayor said, well, maybe not to babies. And then th that was the beginning of the city finally taking on responsibility that there was an issue. And uh, then that's when we went into, you know, throwing Bevan Baker under the bus, finding somebody, some black person to, to you know, uh, blame, and then getting rid of the computers and, you know, over and over and over again. So, so I say that to say that I do agree with you that nonprofits could be a part of the solution, um, especially since we have the most nonprofits in the nation. We should be able to somehow or another address that. Let's at least give the last two people who have been standing here a fair opportunity to ask their questions. I want to say, when I worked, at, I checked at the SDC in Northcott, they're already in this program, but they're only doing like one house that's not dealing with the problem. Yes, sir. Uh, so, yes, sir. You have a question or comment? Well, uh, no, no. We're, we're well, running out of yeah, time. We're okay. we're okay. I mean, bottom line is that if, if there's somebody that needs to be, you know, worked with or a problem that needs to be addressed, both Lena and I would do it. Um, you know, there's no question about that. Yes, we have to take action. And if there was a question of a legal issue, I would work with the city attorney's office or other attorneys to make sure that we were minimizing our legal exposure. But other than that, yes, absolutely solve the problem because, you know, in this case, it is a public health issue. Okay. And it's even so worse. You guys, questions quickly. Nick McVeigh, fifth at the end. Go ahead. Nick McVeigh, fifth district aldermanic uh, candidate. Um, so my question is, you said something about TIFFs. So under current state statutes, it does um, mention specifically lead contamination. Yes, and with the creation of TIDs, they can use that money to also take care of some of that stuff in the area where the TID is being created. So as mayor, would you make that mandatory in the city contracts that they would have to replace with some of that TID money, you know, the surrounding area, I think it's up to half mile. Would you make it mandatory in those city contracts to replace those lead laterals? What I've seen done is when people are doing projects, you know, again, you know, based on science, um, you know, based on having the money there, um, if we have the money in it, um, you know, sure, yes. You know, um, if it's not the right thing to do on a case by case basis, I think I would look at it, you know, from that perspective. But yes, you have to get out the lead as quickly and as intelligently you know, as you can, um, and if it's going to, you know, work as long as, you know, it's again, it's a public health issue, it has to get done, how are you going to sequence it? Uh, back, back up to the microphone, please. So, the question was, would you make it mandatory whenever there's a city contract for a TID that that was in there, that they had to use a certain amount in that well, we're making there. a certain amount of money available to them, so these you know, kids are like tens of millions. Oh, I know they're they're, they're they're huge, and you know, there's usually you know great benefits you know that are you know coming to the you know people that are that are using them. Um, as long as it makes sense and it balances, sure, you know. Possibly so. Yes, sir. Last question. 
Hi, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Taylor and uh, Mr. Reski. Uh, drinking water is a national problem, which is actually a lesser known measure in federal Green New Deal proposed legislation, which also includes a similar issue of air quality concerns that overwhelmingly harm disadvantaged communities. So by extension, the Green New Deal and Milwaukee Common Council will uh, include that language. That being said, do you support such an effort in Milwaukee and why or why not? You know, um, it wasn't until most recently that I was even aware of the Green New Deal, um, and it actually came from sitting through uh, a process with an organization called Citizen Action. Um, I have an initiative that I've worked on, and it is using a hub model to be able to create pathways to work to create both um, entrepreneurship, empowerment in both entrepreneurship and employment for health and wealth transformation in this community. The, the Love and Faith Initiative is literacy in those hubs, access to opportunity, helping people to have voice from civic to advocacy, and then empowerment in, as I mentioned, entrepreneurship and employment. The areas that I want individuals to learn those pathways in is environmental, is one of them. And because of the fact that, as you mentioned, some of our environmental challenges in this community, like for example, we have a um, coal plant that's near us, and they have to plant trees because the water, qu the, the water quality in our, I mean not water, air quality in our area is challenged by that. Um, the city has not um, been a partner in that, I think, in the way that they could. Everything from, um, you know, teaching individuals how to be arborists at a level that could satisfy the number of arborists that we need in the southeastern region. When I brought that to the mayor, he said there are no end jobs in forestry. Well, forestry is learning to be an arborist, um, urban forestry in particular. So all that to say is I do support not only green jobs, I do, I do support environmental changes, not just with air, but also with soil. We have major contaminated soil in this area. I would love to see us extract soil and use compost to grow soil so that we could use that for some replacement. This is why agriculture is a huge portion of what I would like to see us use and take advantage of in this city so that we could not only um, do reclamation and, and cleaning of our soil, but we also then could grow food to help to deal with our food deserts. So there's a whole cycle of things that I think that we could do in the area of urban agriculture, which really does address the issues that are in the Green Deal. Uh, so before you uh, jump into that, let me add, um, you did mention that uh, you did mention the coal power plant that we energies currently runs Correct. in the city so part of green new deal legislation would be um, the mun municipalization of that public utility and transitioning over into renewable energy uh, uh, sources so, so that as you being know, said oh, is I'm that sorry. something that you would support um, is, is that is is that something that you would make part of your platform so three things one as you know we energies has really fought against um, renewable energy, um, but in the Love and Faith Initiative that I spoke about, um, the innovation part of the faith, the I of innovation, it's uh, environmental, forestry, agriculture, innovation, trades, and health. Um, one of the things that I'd love to see us do is do more with solar panels. I'd love to see us have solar farms, and basically that means having solar panels, you know, uh, in some community areas. Uh, they've done that in some other cities. I also would love to see on those foreclosed properties that we do have a solar panel on those. And if there is a way, and I do not know statutorily at this moment if it is or is not possible, I would love for that solar, solar panel to stay and for us to have some ownership as a municipality in that regard. So that is to say, I would love for us to move in that way because once again, we are a community. So I would love to see if there was a way for us to do some things from a cooperative kind of fashion. Um, and, and one other thing right. as well, sorry. Um, so part, part of this would be that we would eventually, if we want to um, avoid the most uh, detrimental parts of climate change, we would need to divest entirely from fossil fuels. Uh, in the very that's, near future. So what would be your proposed timeline uh, for phasing out the coal power plant? I can't answer a timeline for you at this moment because one of the things I believe in is researching. And so I would have to understand exactly what that takes and what those processes are. But what I will say to you is that even back several years ago when President Obama was still in, there was some push to try to put those kind of um, 
steps into place. And as a state legislator, I was supportive in trying to push our companies to do, um, do that effort under the Walker administration and under the Trump administration, some of those things got uh, well, pushback is the best way I know to articulate it. So um, changing rapidly would be great, but that may not be possible. But I'll say this as rapidly as we can. You know, one of the things that um, I will tell you about me is I have a sense of urgency. It's, it's, it's part of the energy and the passion, right, that I have. I have a sense of urgency about the lead. I have a sense of urgency about the, um, the, the food lack that exists in our community. I have a sense of urgency about the homelessness. I have a sense of urgency about the foreclosed properties. And God knows I have a sense of urgency about the Fire and Police Commission and the corruption that's there and the Milwaukee Police Department. I could go on, right? Unemployment, home ownership, entrepreneurship. And so my goal will be education a mayor does not control the school district it is controlled by the school board but i would want to go and wrap my arms around but my point is is that it, in whatever is a reasonable and rapid timeline that we could do we can't let anybody get lost so absolutely the fundamental issues fundamental problems that are really affecting people the most absolutely uh, clean air clean water that's important to everybody, whether you're a business owner or not. So me, my personal itself being a fiscal conservative, that doesn't change the fact that the air has to be clean, the water has to be clean, um, and everything else, you know, the soil, you know, as well. Solve all those big problems. Green, absolutely. That's the way to go. Um, it, it's just the smartest thing to do. Um, then managing the change, because I guarantee you that you know anybody that's in the carbon-based economy is also going to probably be there, you know, or most of the big you know players are going to be there in the green economy. So there's no reason not to work with them. I think all they're really looking for, you know, is the fact that somebody's not trying to vilify them, even if they've done something wrong. Yes, I understand, um, but. You know, they're going to be there no matter what. So clean energy, green energy, 100%, I'm right in the corner. You know, w no matter which one of us gets it. Probably if I get in, you're going to see Lena there anyway because, you know, I think these problems are just too big. Um, you know, um, and it's, you know, sure, you know, I have ideas. I would like to do things. But it's more important to get to the right solution. And that's one of the things that I'm, you know, just uh, viciously known for is trying to do the right Thing. So, so okay, we've come to the end. Uh, so, I um, actually, can I just... Sure, go ahead. We, we, so, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, I mean, I never actually got an answer about whether you... About what, climate change? Well, I, I didn't get an climate. answer about the municipalization of We Energies and your actual stance on the Green oh, I, so I, like As long as we could work it into the budget, I wouldn't mind doing it. And I'd also... Could we you know, uh, try take to these the questions quickly. after the, the forum? Yeah, sure. Would that yeah, be absolutely. fair? Absolutely. Would that be fair? Just because it's 7 o'clock on a weeknight, right? Okay, perfect. Thank so, you. So, uh, I'm sorry, Robert Miranda can't close us down. He can speak uh, much better than I can. My name is Derek Byer. I'm with the Get the Let Out Coalition. Um, I want to first thank the African American Women's Center for hosting this important debate. And I just want to say, if you're not a member, you should, be, you know, and um, if, if there's a way for you to um, use the African American Women's Center, you should. They always open it up for community events like this, and so it would be great for you to do that, people. Sounds good to me. It's the first time I was here, actually, I'm working on four years now. I'm just, I'm unpaid. I'm a dude from Milwaukee that Robert Miranda got me hooked into this issue, and uh, it, it kind of takes hold on you on, on a human level. I've led laterals. I was an MPS high school teacher. I taught a lot of students affected by this issue, and it just, you know, I get politics, but I don't understand why we're, we're sitting here having these talks. We should be we should be talking about what we did already, in my opinion. So um, it is obviously very disappointing, and we need, to, we need to see this. Who is not here, right? So thank you to Senator Lena Taylor. Thank you to Mr. Rasky. That's, we really appreciate it. But there are two people that are not here. And this is not politics. This is a human issue. This is a public health issue. People who cannot defend themselves drink this water. So it's on us the adults. So I don't want to preach too much here, but I do want to say we were, the first time I was here was two, two, three years ago with Flint activists in this very room. Here we are again. Um, so anyways, that's, it's a little frustrating at this point, but we're still having the debate. We're still fighting. So our, our coalition, we're an unfunded grassroots organization. We can use any 
help that you can give us. So join on, follow our posts, come to our events, and we got to keep pushing. So I want to thank everyone for coming, um, and that's all I have. I, I have a get I the have, let out. I'm sorry. I have one question. Since we do have a couple of individuals from the media that are here, can we offer them the opportunity to ask if they have a question? I have no personal problem, but this is the end of the debate. But if there's any media questions, I'm I have no problem. Looks like they have none. Do you have one? Questions? Nope. All is well. I think one thing that you guys can do is get out the vote, get everybody to vote, and the other thing you can do is get Lena and I into the general election on April 7th. If you want to see a solution, if you want to see solutions that you're going to be able to live with, that's what I recommend you do. Get Lena and I into the general election for April 7th.